going to give us an overview? Thank you, Mayor, members of Council. Tonight for the agenda overview, we have uh, broken it down for the uh, Council interest. Then there is a follow-up from your last meeting in December, uh, dealing with the elected, elected school board. Then, under one of the city priorities, Life on Learning, we have three of our partners here tonight. For the Early Learning Advisory Board, we have Angelica Light and Barry Bishop to give you an update. For the Newborn Universal Screening and Referral Project, we have uh, Suzanne DePriere and Heike, excuse me, um, Heike Nix, I think I got that right. And then uh, lastly, for an update for the United for Children, we have Carol McCormick to provide us with um, what I believe is. And uh, Mayor, before I turn it back over to you, I have Lori Crouch for a very brief announcement. Good evening, Mayor and members of Council. Um, I'm really excited about a new marketing campaign that is literally going to be hitting the streets here very quickly. Um, we have five new waste management trash trucks that will be hitting the street um, within uh, a little uh, soon. Uh, this is a quick rundown of what the trucks are, but just real quickly, um, they are uh, going to be equipped with GPS, so as the rest of the trash trucks that we have in our fleet. They'll have an improved mobility, so they'll be able to get in and out of some of the tight corners that we have on Norfolk streets, and they are going to exceed the 2010 California mission, so literally these five trucks will be green machines. Um, they'll also be enclosed so that we won't have trash uh, flying down the street. Um, we have developed an anti-littering campaign. Part of what happens with these trucks is we got to wrap these trucks with whatever message we wanted for five years. And we decided that anti-littering um, was really important for the city of Norfolk. It also mirrors a nationwide campaign created by Keep America Beautiful. So soon you will see these trucks. We have five unique messages on the side of these trucks. Um, and basically it's just a fun way to get people's attention to say, breaking up on Valentine's Day, well, littering is wrong too. <laughs> Double dipping at a party, littering <coughs> is wrong too. Sugar at bedtime, littering is wrong too. Sending Mother's Day flowers COD, littering is wrong too. And then no if, ands, or buts. Cigarettes are litter too. And then we'll also have our safety message on the back of the trucks. But these trucks will be in our Norfolk neighborhoods very soon with a very important message to remind folks to pick up their trash. And then a fun way in which we're, we're going to share that message. Great. Thank you, Laurie. Anything else, Mr. Manager? Is it, Mayor? Great. <clears throat> Anybody want to comment on the waste management trucks? Anything? No? Okay. We're going to do council interest. And Mamie, I'm going to start down there with you. And we'll work this way. Okay? Um, as Mayor Jim. at Team Norfolk and neighborhood. I think that on December 20th, when we went out for the city of Norfolk, it thank my colleagues on the city council, employees of the city of all of you could have been there. gathered at Richard Bowling Elementary. And also a special thank you to you. Um, Chief Goldsmith and Rogers and It was wonderful. Rogers and I had an opportunity to sit down in neighbor's dining room table just to do a couple of things. <coughs> and they were very surprised to see Goldsmith and I explained to them. That is what he does as part of the city. 
Thank you again. Um, and I think we even have a picture of Andy with a mop from the oh, oh, feeding. Yeah. He's Angela, got Andy thank with you. a mop. Uh, don't a we? special thank you to Andy who often a bucket and on gloves <laughs> uh, at our December 20th event and he said that that was part of what his so thank you well, Andy and he had a great time we had a great time thank, well I can just know is that uh, when I had my first food handles card there was no there were no gloves so that was a whole nother experience for me it was great. You did you did a Your great daughter, job. Your daughters came out as well. You did a terrific job. Great. Hey, I have um, three Thank things. You. The first one is uh, Marcus. Uh, two years ago, when we were kind of really facing our budget crunch, there used to be a truancy center that was at the um, uh, Workforce Development Center at Ward's Corner. And what happened is that any time a student that was um, roaming the streets during school hours, the police would pick them up and then take them to that center in which a parent or somebody had to come and pick up the student. When that budget got eliminated, um, they put it back where the police officers actually have to take the students back to the school. And the schools are having issues with that because there's no real parental involvement then, but also uh, when the police officers drop them off, then basically what they do is they walk right back out the door um, if they're, you know, skipping. Um, I think it was also better when there was a um, central location that our officers could take um, the students and then there were pe professionals there that could handle it. Um, since things are looking a little bit better with our budget, um, if that's something that could be considered as you're going through the process, I believe the um, Commonwealth Attorney's Office also um, loved that program because it allowed them to have the opportunity to uh, catch a couple juveniles that they needed to talk to as well uh, with that. But it was just, I think it was better for the city that was one location, parents knew where to pick up students, and it also helped the schools and the police officers out with that communication. Um, <clears throat> I'm going to pass you a letter. Um, this is from the Eagle On Alliance, if you can send this down. Um, I. Yeah, I just wanted to share with you that um, just a little update on our Eagles. Uh, the Eagle on Alliance dropped the lawsuit uh, against the um, various organizations. And the reason for that is because uh, the Eagles have now nested outside of the Botanical Gardens. Actually, they've moved into Ward 5, and I've visited their nest. Um, they are on private property now, um, so the federal agencies, the city, nobody can get them. Um, but there's actually been some positive things that have come out of this, including that the airport um, has a full-time person now that actually is out working and deterring uh, the birds that are on the runway, which was one of the things that Eagle On and, and I and a few other people have been asking for. Um, and we, we hope that, uh, obviously, you know, we hope the eagles never come back um, and mm -hmm. nest on the botanical gardens where they can be harassed. But if that were to happen, we hope that this is a good time for the city to work with the citizens on coming up with some other ways um, to handle this so that we don't have the same mess that we had last time uh, with it. Um, but they, they have dropped the lawsuit, um, obviously with the option to refile if they needed to. Um, there's some legal term for that, right, Andy? Um, so, um, but anyway, I just wanted to give you that update. Um, on it. And then finally, um, a few members of the Bike Commission have contacted me with some concerns on how uh, Norfolk Police Department handles issues with cyclists. Um, there's a feeling that the Police Department tends to side more with um, the cars and they don't know the law um, as well as they should. And they've actually burned, they sent a couple of emails I think today to actually start working with the police department on, on our statutes when it comes to that and cleaning that up so that there is some clarity um, regarding that. I think, Terry, you may know a little bit more about that because I know you're more involved, but um, it is an issue and they've asked um, for us to start addressing that. I guess if um, Burns' office, if you can 
uh, work with the chief and city manager um, and figure out where those concerns are. The commission hopefully can bring them to our um, attention um, and then we can handle it if it's just some um, changes in our ordinance. I, I don't know if it needs to go higher than that, but that's it. Thank you. Thank you. Andy. Well, being in a library, I have to, um, I went online and I did a little bit of research. And it's in English, but it's from a, uh, a high school in Athens. And it's two sentences that seem to cover what we've done here. Uh, the first public libraries were found in, in ancient Greece in the fourth century BC. And what these high school students wrote was this translated in English. Libraries were normally standing next to a temple and consisted mainly of a large storage room for books and a porch on which one might read or from where one could take a walk in the gardens or from where works could be recited aloud to an audience. Well, that sentence that these young Greek uh, students wrote uh, exemplifies and manifests here what we've done in Norfolk. But the actual building itself, the public libraries being beautifully constructed with splendid colonnade facades through which they were ascending stairs, similar to what we have here, so that more than merely entering a library, one ascended into a temple of the wisdom. So. I think that when we look at what's happened here and what the previous councils have done and uh, gotten us to where we are, um, you guys have done a terrific job. Just, you did a great job, Paul. And uh, it's very important uh, to know where our libraries come from and uh, where we are today and that it's, uh, and that this edifice uh, really does date back to and has its original purpose. Uh, with that, if I could, I'm going to go next to, um, I guess, Lori, you used a term, wrapping. Uh, and I was downstairs in this edifice of wisdom. And I don't know if we have seen this. This is coach and athletic director. It's a periodical here in the library. And I was just looking to find something to read. And it's out of Michigan. And uh, perfecting MEAC tournament all about details. And it talks about scope and wrapping scope. And uh, Mr. Thomas, who does a great job as the commissioner, Dennis Thomas, says, Thomas estimates that nearly 41,000 fans passed through the doors of Scope Arena during last year's conference tournament. And if I would say that's a success, that is a real success. It says the MEAC tournament must impress fans, student athletes, coaches, and administrators so the conference works with nearly a dozen different groups to make it all possible. That includes the city, arena personnel, media partners, et cetera. Uh, and I just want to make sure this is great for the city, great uh, uh, publicity for the city. It's great publicity for Scope Arena. I don't know if you've seen it or, Lori, if you've seen it, but you may want to somehow get it out to our people. Uh, but it's very complimentary of the work that the city has done. So let's, if, if I know that we're probably way down the road because the tournament comes up very soon, uh, but we may want to uh, thank Mr. Thomas for his kind words because he did a very good job for us. Uh, next, if I could talk a little bit about Meadowbrook Civic League. Marcus, I, I've received a letter, and I know Barkley may have received the same letter. Uh, it deals with the fire station issue. Uh, I think that Meadowbrook is uh, a civic league that felt a little bit uh, slighted and a little bit out of the original process when we went through the RFP and uh, I think they want to be much more proactive than we may be allowing them so I w I'm going to give you this letter if you could pass it along um, they really want to be more proactive and I would ask that we allow the Civic League to be much more proactive uh, if anything it would be a wound healing issue uh, and so we need to take care of them uh, they uh, they have uh, They've been complimentary of city staff, um, but there are uh, three questions that they ask that I think they've been put off on, and they really want their input now. They don't want to wait. Also, Meadowbrook has dealt with our traffic engineering. Uh, there is an issue with uh, speeds in the neighborhood, 
And if you could, um, I'd ask that we get traffic engineering involved. Lori, you may be a little bit more uh, uh, informed on this issue than I am. If you could just follow up and make sure that we get traffic engineering involved on the speeding issue that goes through the neighborhood. Um, I got a separate letter on that. Uh, next, uh, I know that Paul and I have another constituency, uh, and uh, they are in our next building, which is next week, uh, that opens. Um, we really need to take care of the judges in books. Uh, they, there's 31 bookcases that are needed, and I think that there's a communication issue. We all communicate differently, um, and lawyers are very attuned, judges are very attuned to communication, and I think that when staff deals with them, sometimes they feel a little bit put off. Uh, and we really need to take care of them. Uh, and, I, and I say this in the sense that when you're a lawyer or you're a judge, and, and Paul and I live in this world, your desk, your chair, your pen, for some people, a dictaphone, uh, your books, uh, those, are, those are our tools. Uh, for some people, a computer is. But you know, you're looking at these judges and they're asking for bookcases. Uh, so there's 31 bookcases that are needed. I have the email. I'm going to pass it to you. And I believe that we, uh, it, just out of respect for them, we need to take care of that issue. And uh, I, I think that we had talked about this earlier, but we need to make sure that this is, is uh, taken care of. They're on order? Okay, I'll make sure that I communicate. I'll be in court tomorrow, and I'll be a hero, and they'll rule my way now. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so I'll communicate that to them that they are on order, because they were concerned they were not. Uh, but I appreciate you letting me know. Um, I'm still going to pass this to you. Uh, okay, it's fine. Listen, man, just get it done, because <laughs> that's what we do. But thank you, because I know that you've done a great job over there, and, and uh, I, I appreciate it, Ron. Lastly, one of the constituents that Barkley and I have has sent us a letter. Um, uh, Barkley, you can retire now because I'm doing all this for you. Uh, About time. <laughs> it is. Oh, I've got That's five good. civic leagues, um, and I'm proud of it. Uh, uh, one of our constituents has sent us a letter about uh, dealings with the city and a particular pipe. Uh, he feels that uh, it's the city's responsibility, and perhaps it needs to go to a higher level of examination. And uh, I know him well. He lives in my neighborhood. He's a very upstanding citizen, um, a local CPA. Uh, and his concern is, is that uh, the city's pipe was improperly installed originally. He has a contractor. There are some issues. And I'm going to pass this to you all. So if you could take care of this gentleman, I'd appreciate it. Um, Anything else? Uh, no, that's it. I, thank you. And uh, again, uh, and I didn't get a chance to tell. Bill Inge was here earlier. And let me tell you what, if you don't know Bill Inge, that guy really knows his stuff. Uh, we are very blessed to have Bill here and his passion for what he does. Uh, everyone, uh, don't get me wrong, I'm not taking anything from anyone else, but Bill just has such a passion for his, the, the sergeant room, the historical buildings. Uh, that we are really blessed to have him in this city uh, to keep on those legacies of architecture and construction. So that's all I have. Thank you, Paul. Thank you. Yeah. Thank Mark, you, you, got any, you got anything I have else? like 30 <laughs> civic leagues. Well, You're welcome. But, uh, uh, Marcus, the only thing I just want to keep on the front burner is this kind of public-private partnership downtown we're having with trying to create retail for small businesses and promote traffic and uh, I know you may have told me when you're going to report in on that but will you remind me we have a meeting tomorrow <clears throat> when do you think we'll come to council with the what that that that's separate um, so my commitment has been that uh, they'll have to keep up with us so we have a so we're prepared from the city side so it's just the, the private sector okay thank you that's all I have man terrific yeah. um, one of the things that I would hope is that parents can feel comfortable in dropping their children off here at the library on Saturdays or some afternoons uh, in regards to predators, that we have zero tolerance uh, in terms of any encroachment or unpleasant um, 
situations that a child could be put in. I would imagine a child 12 years old uh, and older should be able to be dropped off on a Saturday to enjoy the library. And I just hope that the library staff, the police department, uh, will exercise zero tolerance when it comes to anything that would be unpleasant for a child. And speaking of uh, something that's unpleasant for a child, I haven't had a chance to call this parent back, but I'll probably do it tomorrow morning. I'll also put her in touch with the chief. Got a call in my office today that uh, this lady's 10-year-old son was handcuffed by, uh, by uh, our police department. As I say, I don't have the particulars but unless it was something that was extremely drastic, uh, I think that that's kind of over the top to handcuff a 10-year-old, uh, especially in light of all the things that's happening uh, nationwide. Uh, we're trying to get our children to uh, respect and embrace our police officers, but you know, this could be something that could make a child you know, very distasteful uh, about our police department. But I'm gonna be in touch with the chief in the morning and this parent. Thank you. I think we're out of time, so. <laughs> um, I have just something very <coughs> uh, One of our other surrounding cities is putting in LED lights on all of their, um, uh, you know, city lights. Are we moving toward that also? For ch changing a, pardon? Project Virginia Beach. Yeah. Yeah, that was, a, um, that was done under construction. Right. Um, and for that... Certainly any time we change over, can't we uh, be moving toward that or not? Um, no. In that case, Virginia uh, Beach has decided, and there's only, uh, I believe, one other area that I know of in Virginia Beach where they actually uh, install, maintain, own in, uh, the, that actual grid. Um, so LED fixtures in poles is um, a requirement that we have to work with Virginia Power on. We actually, though, have well, good news is that we've been discussing that with them for about a year. Um, and we believe that they've given us the green light to pilot a project um, here in Norfolk for some, some of that um, in this district. Um, so, but it is um, Virginia Power um, regulates what, what uh, bulbs are used, and it's um, not. You know, it's, it's, it's not as progressive as, as we would like. Secondly, are we supporting um, Senator or Delegate Villanueva's proposal for the um, flooding that we read about in the paper? Are we as a city supporting that? We are. Thank you. Yeah, in fact, I don't know if 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 you saw but we've been making great strides on all those issues as far as incorporating not all, i mean the state is doing what they're doing because of the leadership provided by the the manager and the staff and here in the city of norfolk and that bill that uh that ron is on the on the senate side it's um is it it's not frank is it no is it linwood maybe yeah i mean that have been uh, working really hand in glove with uh, with uh, Pennington to draft this stuff. So the answer so is yes. Issue, yeah. Part and, of it and just recently, to... both uh, Senator Kane and Senator uh, Warner, I saw a letter today, they signed to the White House, to the actually the, the uh, Assistant Secretary of the uh, Army, who's, who's, in, who's in charge of that, really the Army Corps of Engineers for this final study that we will need to move forward into really Construction budget in a but this was year. directly talking about bringing the monies back to this area as you know from this bill and I thought it certainly sh showed warrant at the state level and so I was hoping that our package included that thank you Angela um, I only have two things uh, first of all I just would like to thank the manager's office in winter um, and the clerk and the staff for helping me get things done over the holiday when we were out between last meeting and this meeting, they did a real good job. And it makes my list really short. Um, the Bank Street Memorial Baptist Church in Norfolk has a historical marker that was, um, I don't know if it was knocked over, driven over, or something or another like that. And they've contacted the Historical Society, but they don't seem to be getting any help 
in terms of getting that memorial established back um, in its place downtown. And I think they turn 175 or 176 this year, something like that. So if we could help them facilitate that process a little bit better, um, that would be helpful. And um, I just want to piggyback off of something Mr. Riddick said, and I think the library has this policy in place, but in terms of dropping children off, we also want to make sure parents know that the library is not a babysitting service for children, so we need to make sure that parents are dropping off children at an appropriate age so that our staff members don't end up being babysitters. And that's it. Okay. Mr. Angela, Mayor. Thank you. I just, I have a question for Ron. Um, Ron, you said that Dominion Power will pilot the LED lights here in Norfolk. They're going to pilot it for They've us. given us an initial indication that they would like to pilot something. Um, part of, and part, what part of that pilot is supposed to do is to determine what fixture would be appropriate for Virginia Power to adopt as an, um, a bulb that they would accept and partner with localities. Um, so that, that's part of it. So we, when we were working on the Granby lighting project, that's where it first started uh, discussion, and they'd like to see where they could test it. Um, and just to, again, the caveat about the Virginia Beach is that was a construction project, so everything was going in new. Um, and they decided they're, they're going to own that, much like they do the boardwalk. It's a so did they do the lights, or did Virginia? They did it as part of construction project. The lights. Interesting. Have we ever done that? Um, we put lights in as part of construction project, just like we're doing for the main or downtown, you know, transit center or the campus Stella school that's under construction. But um, we've never owned and maintained our own. That would that would be a, a new frontier to actually be responsible for the, the upkeep of, of those lights. Okay. All right. Th thank you. Um, the next agenda item is uh, more uh, council discussion about the elected school board. Um, Bernard, correct me if I'm wrong, but if, if the council is going to take a formal position, which we should, uh, in order for the General Assembly to, to take action, we should advertise something for a public hearing at our next meeting. <clears throat> that am I too late, or is that right? Uh, no, no. That I mean, the um, next meeting is the twenty seventh, right? That um, there are um, uh, methods the council could um, elect without further general assembly action, so that um, a method by ward. Uh, to duplicate the method of election of the council or at large is permitted without any further general assembly action or a combination of the two that includes all of the other elements of the statute um, uh, like uh, having any wards coterminous with existing council wards and elections simultaneous with the uh, council members um, so that there are some methods that can be done without further uh, General Assembly action. If the council elects a method that's not permitted under the statute, then that special legislation would be needed in this session. And uh, Mr. Pennington has been working with our delegation uh, so that we can submit it. Um, that, that it's a short session, so the sooner we get it there, the, the better our prospects would be if that's what we're going to do. Well, help me with this because I'm still a little confused, okay? If the council decides, for instance, to have an at-large system, just for, do we need to go to the General Assembly? No. Okay. If we decide to do the ward system, which is, you know, that, that we would have one, you know, school board member, member elected from the, the same way each city council member is elected, do we need to go to the General Assembly? If we want to do a hybrid of those, do we have to go to the General Assembly? Um, if it does not meet the other criteria in the statute, the two biggest being Co coincident boundaries and um, simultaneous elections. I, I, okay, I have a question for you. There's a lot circulating now on some blogs, um, local blogs, about the fact that we actually do need General Assembly action on any of them because of changes that we made to the term limits last year that the General Assembly would actually have to strike that language out 
because we would have conflicting language then um, between our charter and the state code. Um, and so even if we went with a ward or at-large system, although it's allowed, we would still need some type of general assembly action to strike that language out. And these are just average citizens who found that um, that were involved in this process. And I don't know if anybody else got oh, that email. <laughs> um, average citizens who were yeah. right. <laughs> uh, average, average citizens who are involved. <laughs> yes, I know that's an oxymoron. An average, right. Right. <laughs> yes, okay. uh, I've seen uh, Vivian Page's uh, yeah. blog um, adopting Max Shapiro's opinion of the law yes and, and it's not accurate that okay uh, it's a it, it's a appreciated um, um, concern and involvement uh, but you uh, elected to amend a state statute that provided for two-year terms for school board members and to increase it to three the existence of that statute does okay. not defeat the referendum and the terms are in effect until uh, uh, 2016 when the initial school board is elected okay. so prior to the initial school board you retain appointive powers and the terms of those people are three years <coughs> uh, and that uh, after you choose the method of election it will be very good housekeeping to eliminate that s statute that provides for three-year terms because the statute governing elected school boards makes it four year and so that would confuse people who didn't spend much time with it so that's a housekeeping thing okay. that will follow um, whatever you um, determine to do with the method of electing the popular school board but those three-year terms and your appointing powers are in effect until 2016 okay just to know I didn't agree with them I just said I'd bring it up thank, thank so. you no <laughs> what that, when is the general what does the session end it ends in mid-February uh, right right so if if we're going to take some action uh, that they could take action on we would have to do it by I think the 27th and that, maybe that's not exactly the case but that just seems to me like 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 the best move is to try to do something even if we just eliminate a couple of the options or one or one of the options by the time we get to the 27th what I'd like to do is get in, be in a position by the 27th to either vote for one system, or maybe we just have two options left, um, and try to come to some agreement somehow on one of the options. See what, uh, um, uh, and maybe we can talk a, a little bit about it. Um, now, I've, I've gone back over my notes over um, the last discussion that, that we had. Um, um, I, I come back to where I was. I, I think that we keep it simple, and we have a city council election now that has one member elected completely at large, two elected in from you know, the city being basically cut in half, and then five from smaller portions. That's complicated enough. Uh, and then, yeah, and so I'm left with if you can keep it simple by just following either that pattern. Or going to an at-large system and I know I know there are other opinions here that that seems to be the to me to be the, the two most straightforward choices and then I come back to the issue about diversity what system can we put in place that will give us at least ensure us of the most diversity both racially and from a geographic standpoint and I, I, I am left again favoring the uh, system that we have but I, I know there's a hybrid system which could satisfy some of those issues as well um, and then there is the at-large system which I know a lot of people like I'm not sure I heard that from the council that of either the the ward system or the hybrid system there seemed to be a lot of discussion about that more than there was about the you know having the at-large option on the table Does anybody want to weigh in on that I mean do they want to if like if you had if if the council were going to pick between two systems and the hybrid system I take it is the one that the Tommy has crafted or put put on the table um, would we would be we be willing to consider either a ward system plus that or the hybrid system or you still want to keep all three on the table and I I just buddy help me I mean you... well I I spoke at length at the last meeting uh, why I strongly feel that the at-large system is the best way to do it so I'm not going to reiterate that I think 
you all know what I had to say last time. But I, that was the view for the at large. Any other? I, I just want to say, I, I know we have to, to make a decision, but part of our discussion um, involved um, the citizen um, input um, as far as discussions with, with the citizen. How do we go about doing that? Making sure that there is enough time provided um, that we can hear, although we had the, the two um, meetings, I don't think that we gave the citizens um, ample time to, to weigh in and um, tell us exactly what they, they wanted or how we could exactly have dialogue with the citizens. And that's one of the, the larger parts of what I got out of Ruffner, the meeting at Ruffner, as well as Granby um, High School, that the citizens really wanted to talk to us and just share some, some dialogue. And if we're gonna do it, um, how many planned meetings are we going to have with the, the citizens? When um, are they going to take place? Um, and hopefully it would be before we have to um, make this decision because we're rushed again because of, of deadlines. So I'm, I'm really interested. I, I, I'm in no rush to make this decision, right. believe me. And I'm the, you know, the city attorney tells us that we have all sorts of time if okay. we don't put a hybrid system on the, right. Right, on, on the, the, the table. But if we're gonna, if we're going to do that, then we need some form of, we need to take action sooner than later. I'm, I'm, I am perfectly okay, and I think uh, the last thing we want is to move too quickly. If the council thinks we should have, you know, more town hall meetings or more discussion, it may be another uh, public hearing or something. I, I'm all I'm for all that stuff. I'm, I'm just, I didn't want the 27th to go by and then somebody say, well, you guys should have acted sooner. Yeah, I just wanted to suggest, you know, in the hybrid model that I've presented, the first election in 2016 shows an elected uh, member by Ward 6 and elected by Ward 7 and one elected at large. Is it possible to submit legislation that allows that to go forward, which is actually pretty much what you said, Paul, um, and then we can continue the conversations to figure out how the remainder of the um, other seats will be selected. Um, and have that legislation ready. Um, I, I don't want to delay it. I, I think the citizens have asked for this, but if, if it's Councilwoman Johnson's um, desire to involve the community even more, then that does give us an opportunity, if we can, to at least set up the first election to start planning for that, which kind of follows um, the ward seats as well as an at-large person, um, and then allow the four to be determined. Now. If the ultimate decision is to go to a ward, you do create a conflict later on um, on which ward does not have a representative um, if you, since you've used one as an at-large. I cannot support a ward system. Um, I've stated in a letter to you that it's either the hybrid or at-large for me. Um, and you know, one of my concerns is that um, in a ward system, um, there's a possibility that you will never have a minority representation, majority on school board uh, because of how we've um, divided it up. And that's one of the reasons why I presented the plan um, in the hybrid way is because you actually have that opportunity um, to do that. You know, and it's interesting what Tommy says. Um, I, I do believe that in the ward system, it's going to be very difficult to have a, a uh, minority majority uh, as it is set up. Um, that being said, uh, it's also makes it interesting is that you have, uh, if you have two people who live close together within a, sim uh, a single ward uh, and you have uh, qualified, regardless of race, they're qualified, uh, we could end up losing that it's the it's the flip argument it, you could end up losing that uh that second individual who would be very strong and qualified merely because they lost an election uh where if you have the hybrid or the the uh 
election citywide, then they all, everybody, no matter where you live, has that strong opportunity to uh, be vetted uh, by the city as a whole. So I, I do see that. But one question I have is, and this basically goes to the, to Paul and Paul, uh, Paul Squared, is uh, you all lived the transition, and I think maybe it's the lawyer in me, but you two lived the transition over from at large to ward. It took a lawsuit, probably the lawsuit was an extended period of time, months if not years, I'm not sure. But ultimately, when you came to your ward system, how long did it take to come to the boundaries to make that decision? From, from start of lawsuit, which I'm sure the city was contemplating, and historically, tell me if I'm wrong, because you were on council, Paul, were they already talking about if we lose this, we should divide it up a certain way? Because uh, <coughs> uh, Absolutely not. It was, um, you know, the. The lawsuit had gone on, the Collins lawsuit had gone on for years, and I know Paul has his own opinion, but um, this was up in the Fourth Circuit, and one of the judges who had supported the at-large system changed his mind, and, that, and then the matter uh, got sent back uh, uh, to us to create the, the, uh, the ward system, and this, the civil rights attorneys were all over this. I mean, they were... Uh, the, the lawyers for the, the legal aid fund out of Washington um, were um, uh, determined to have this ward system put in place, and they were not going to have any at-large portion of it. Where there was a discussion with their, their attorneys about could we elect the, the um, mayor at-large, and they um, didn't want any vestige of the at-large system. Uh, quite honestly, there was a computer in City Hall even way back then that had a program on it where we, we came up with this 5-2 system, and Joe Leaf and I actually sat at a table and, and moved the boundaries and came up with something that the, that the lawyers that we presented to Herbert's lawyers, and, um, and they went ahead with it. You couldn't... They accepted uh, uh, it? They, they, they did because, and remember, this is all determined by the law, but right. back then, in order to get a safe seat in which the minority community could actually elect a candidate of their choice. Um, you had to have a certain percentage of African-American vote in the ward, which was, you know, typically a 62 or 63 percent of the ward had to be uh, African-American uh, based on other legal precedents, but on voting patterns historically in the city. And um, so they, you couldn't get look, three small wards that had um, those percentages in it. So they went with two small wards and one overlapping large ward to get three wards that, w that were safe. And, and Paul remembers all of that. And we went to a strict, strict ward system. And, but I, I will, you know, having lived through that, and I'm going to let Paul talk, I mean, uh, I, like I said earlier, I, I got elected at large, and I thought that was a great system. Really did. And but I was one of those guys who was on the inside. <laughs> I mean, there were large blocks of people who lived in Ocean View and down Little Creek Road, but in, and in Campostella and Berkeley, and I mean, places as, as good as I thought we were moving, there were people I came to find out really did not trust us and really thought that it was, um, um, that they were not represented. And, and Despite all of our, you know, and I thought we had a very progressive government with people like Mason Andrews on it and others, the community did not feel uh, like they were well represented, uh, even though if they agreed on our, you know, our, our positions. And um, so, I mean, I, I, I learned to appreciate that at, over time. And then I, you know, of course, ran from the ward system the rest of the time until, you know, eight, nine years ago. But... Uh, I have a deep appreciation for the ward system that I did not have going into it. And I, I think anything less than that uh, is, it would be, it may be old fashioned, but would be a step back. In no, I mean, in, in relationships in this city. I mean, I really, I mean, anything less than the ward system, I think we're buying ourselves a lawsuit. Uh, and, you know, I just, I mean, the Civil Rights Act, the Voting Rights Act is still there. The pre-clearance section is gone, but there were people who, who have memories of what it was like, and, and, and Herbert may come back, <laughs> yeah. you know, but I mean, there are still people who feel, 
in the, especially in the minority community, African American community, and that feel very, very strongly about this. How long did it take you to come up with your system? Not long. I mean, once the court had told us, they put timetables on us. Okay. I mean, it, it was you know it was a matter of a few months by the time people, and then you had to submit it to the to the the lawyers from the other side, actually from the Legal Defense Fund out of uh, Washington. Um, we had to make the proposal, but they had to agree to it before it went to the Justice Department. And then that was another 60 days there because of the preclearance uh, statutes. And it was quite a, pro I mean, it, it was something. And, um, but, but finally, uh, Herbert and his, uh, the other plaintiffs, guys like Wes Wendell and others agreed right. with this, uh, with the system. And it was, it was a hard fought, that, that lawsuit went on for, I think, I want to say, Only Bernard, 10, 10 years. years? 10 years. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, just about. Yeah, I mean, up and back and up and back and up and back. And it, so it, we didn't get to where we are today lightly. And it's not to be fooled with, in my opinion. I mean, I... I, I um, you know, I'm strongly in favor of the ward system. Uh, I remember uh, the old at-large system. And uh, I remember what it took to be elected. And if you've been watching local government uh, for as long as I have, you'd see that you had to be anointed by the shadow government. Now, a lot of you here probably think that there is no such thing as a shadow government, but there is. Uh, if you look at some of the old historical books, they used to call them uh, blue stockings. And those, uh, those individuals still exist. Now, the first time I ran for city council, it was uh, under the old at-large system, and um, there were three seats available, and uh, I came in fourth place uh, behind Betty Howell by at least 4,000 votes. Uh, Joe Jordan uh, was the first uh, African-American elected to the uh, city council. And if you look back in your history books, you can see that it was, uh, he was uh, selected versus being elected. Uh, he was accepted by the, uh, the uh, power structure on the west side. Uh, after that, I think uh, Father Green uh, was uh, elected to council. Well, right at that point, there was some rumbling about a ward system. So the powers that be decided to try to defuse that by allowing uh, John Foster to be elected. And so they really thought that this would, you know, kind of quiet the courts and, and relieve Norfolk of having to go to a ward system, but it didn't happen that way. Um, if I'm not mistaken, I've, and, and I might be mistaken, but I've uh, spoken to a, a couple of people if we go back to the ward, if we go to the ward system with the uh, school board, that very well could uh, turn the whole cycle around and city council could eventually be elected uh, by uh, at large again. And if that happens, then it would be the same thing if you... You meant if we went to an at large school board? Yes, at large school board, yeah. And then it could, you know, revert as far as city council is concerned. But what you have to realize if you go to that large system, is that uh, some of the individuals who live in uh, some of the more urban parts of Norfolk, whether they be black or white, would not be able to be elected. Uh, we had, uh, Norfolk was the first uh, uh, school district in the whole entire United States of America to resegregate its school district. Now, the, um, city, the uh, school board at that time was an appointed school board and the city council at that time was at, an at-large city council at that time. You can look at some of your boards and commissions now. Uh, a lot of the people we see on our boards and commissions, if it were not for the ward system, they would not be there. Uh, you, can, you can look at your planning commissions. We had Bill Craig, he was a good planning commissioner. But uh, your school board, unless you were anointed, you wouldn't be there. And uh, I think we have to realize that while we don't hear much rumbling from the shadow government, they're still there, and they, and they would love to have control of the school board, and they would love to go back to the uh, at-large uh, at type of election uh, for the city council. Um, and it's, uh, I think uh, we would be making a dreadful mistake if we did not do uh, the electing of the school board uh, by wards. One of the things I thought about as I was sitting here I think what, we, what would be good if we just uh, dropped the uh, 
super wards. You get a demographer from, from ODU, uh, uh, get a demographer from uh, uh, Norfolk State, Rudy Wilson. He helped us out uh, some time ago in terms of trying to uh, draw pure wards. And I think if we drew pure wards, we could have um, the possibility of a majority uh, school board that represented the, uh, the, uh, the way the community, the school district is probably over 65 or 70 percent African American. If we drew pure wards and if we got demographers to do this, and it might take a little time, then uh, I think we would be would be well served. And uh, that's all I have to say for this moment. I'll come back in a minute. Oh, when you say, tr are you talking about for the school board or yeah, the school city, board. Not school the board. city council? No, school board. Yeah. Would it be legal if, if, we, to do if that? we're concerned of not uh, not that we're concerned, but a couple of the uh, comments uh, tonight said that if we went to the ward system, we would not have uh, the opportunity of having a majority uh, African American, a majority majority minority uh, school district. And uh, but if you went to uh, a pure election and if demographers drew pure wards, then we could have that possibility. Is that legal to do that? To have what a different, to have a different, uh, well, different uh, ward lines, and you have council lines. That that would be um, uh, able to. You could do that through special legislation. R right now, the act permits a combination <coughs> of one of the two models we've been discussing, um, uh, and the combination change from the pure ward or at large would also have to comply with coterminous and simultaneous elections uh, so that what Mr. Riddick is talking about appears to require the type of legislation that we've been discussing introducing into this session soon if we're going to do something different. Well, we, is, you know, we have such a low turnout. Is it time to also look at a fall election, you know, especially if we end up with at large? to get the interest of the community, get some kind of numbers up to really get a true reading. And maybe that's complicating the issue, but. Uh, One thing I'd like to say is that I'm not uh, in favor of going back to the community. We've had two uh, hearings and uh, I think the, the uh, decision is, uh, is our decision. Uh, all of us, or quite a few of us are talking daily to people and getting calls and, and emails and texts in regards to how the community feels. And I just think that we need to realize that time is, this is, is sensitive and move forward without going back to the public. Dr. Wibber, I was not at the last uh, council meeting, but I did see your remarks about a task force. I don't think we need a task force. It's our decision. And I think we need to realize it's our decision and just going with it. That's um, a couple of things. Um, I do agree with the mayor in terms of um, one of the things that he talked about, about the confusion of voters and from educated voters to those with maybe a lesser education. Um, we, I run across people all the time as during election season who don't know that they can vote for me. They say, oh, Mr. Riddick is my council member. Or um, when Anthony was here, Mr. Burford is my council member. I wish I could vote for you. Well, you can. Um, I don't know how to fix that when we do a lot of outreach during campaign season to get people out to vote, to let them know, you know, where they can vote and who they can vote for. And these are just, these are regular people who go to jobs and go to work and they have families and they're good people and um, on various education levels. Some are, are very intelligent and some, you know, are just your average, everyday, run-of-the-mill person. And um, there, there, are, there are groups of people 
who pay close attention to what goes on. Um, it's it's, it's kind of like in my own situation when I grew up and I wanted to, to register to vote because that was important in my household. Voting was important. And when I was 18, I left school and walked across to the Jordan Newby Library to register to vote. And there are people who were raised and voting was not important. It was haphazard. It was, we saw a lot of it in when Barack Obama first ran for president. There were people who were older than me, and I'm 43 years old yesterday, who were just now registering to vote. And I mean, I don't think that we should complicate things for folks who want to participate in the electoral system. Um, if if we, if people don't clearly understand now who they're able to vote for and, and, and what their, who their representatives are, then adding, I think adding a hybrid system, as much as I do like it, I think would add to confusion and it would possibly take years for people to understand um, who they're voting for or who they are capable of voting for in, um, in an election. Um, that being said, you know, I would like to think that race doesn't matter. And I can honestly say that there is a segment of my own personal life where race doesn't matter. People are good people. If they're white, they're black, they're Asian, it doesn't really matter to me. But I always say kind of jokingly that there's a litmus test to how integrated our lives really are. And that integration, if you have a dinner party, how many people of the opposite race or of a different race are actually on your guest list? How many people come to your house? Um, the other litmus test is weddings and funerals. If you're a black person and you die, how many white people come to your funeral? If you're a white person and you die, how many black people come to your funeral? I mean, those are, major events in an individual's life. And so if people, if, if your life is not really integrated, then um, I don't know, I, I just, I would like to see fairness across the board when it comes to our schools. Our schools have issues. A lot of our schools um, have, uh, have low income, um, uh, student bodies and they have some special needs and everybody's not equal um, every in terms of everybody is equal in their in their ability to learn but everybody's resources are not equal and I would like to see the ability the, the school board have an equal representation across the entire city on its school board, or at least have that ability, whether the person is white or black, pink, green, or purple. But I would like to find a way to ensure that we have fairness and representation from across the entire city. If you don't live, if you live in your ward, how often do you really go outside of the area that you live in, if you live, work, and play in Norfolk? How often do you do that? How often do, how, I don't often go to the west side. It's, it's really not that often. Now that I don't have to go to Old Dominion, I don't go there very often because my life is not entrenched there. But my life is entrenched on the east side of town and on the south side of town. Um, when we have our, our park place um, task force, but that's once every couple of months. How often do people who live on the west side come to military circle? How often do they go to the west side of town, over to the farm fresh that's on Berkeley Avenue? How often does that really happen? So I think that in order to ensure fairness, the entire city needs to be represented on the school board. And I think the way to do that is through the ward system. Not necessarily about race for me personally, but it's just to ensure that there is representation from every part of our city on the school board 
to ensure that all of our schools are properly represented. I'm, I'm not the generation of race. So it's, and, I, and it doesn't mean that I don't understand that racial issues still exist because they do exist. And anyone who says that race issues don't exist, they're just blind, but they're living in a bubble or something. But I want fairness for our school board. And I think that the war system is the best way to get it. The problem is, is it's not about us. It's about the kids at the end of the day. And we're all worried about race and everything else. I, Rodney Jordan's here. I don't look at him as a black man on school board representing black kids in the city of Norfolk. He is a school board member who looks out for everybody who contacts him. I, the, the race thing is just, you know, and it's a generation thing. And I respect those that came before us. But at some point, it's just about what's best for the kids. Isn't it about what's putting the best person on the school board? I mean, why, why do we have to continue to have these types of conversations? It's about who is the best person on the school board. We've done that every time we've selected somebody. Now we're just turning it over to the citizens and asking them to do it. Let them, you know, it, it just, this is, it's too much to, to continue to beat this over a race thing. I, I think, Paul, it needs to be an informal vote right now to find out where everybody is on this, and then we, we know where we need to move forward. But if not, I mean, the NAACP sent a letter saying they don't support a ward system. That's the NAACP. I, I don't understand why, why we're, we're talking about it. Most of the people who came out and spoke, black and white, said they don't want a ward system. I don't know they, they don't have the slightest idea. Even the NAACP, I question their leadership anyway. Uh, at this point, <clears throat> uh, we don't have the slightest idea uh, uh, what the uh, at-large system would do. Certainly, we well, want certainly we want the best uh, person to represent uh, our children, and children are you know the focal point. But uh, <clears throat> without resources, uh, able to raise campaign funds, uh, have these uh, big uh, campaign war chests. The average person would not be uh, able to be elected. You could have some of the, the most sincere uh, individuals that want to represent our children, but unless they're able to get enough money to be elected, then uh, they won't have a voice. And I think that um, one day, uh, you know, maybe you know, 10, 15 years from there, uh, race, you know, won't uh, have a. a an important issue and usually when my when my son comes along this young man sitting here in the front row right here from Grand Bay High School uh, when these guys take over uh, then uh, I think that what you're saying Tommy uh, could be true but right now uh, it's uh, it's uh, not realistic for us to think that uh, that those things exist and that's just you know that's my opinion and uh, I think if you just look at things uh, or just imagine how it would be uh, when when they went to the uh, board system for city council election. Certainly, the persons who were on council at that time, Paul as well, protected themselves. You wonder why Ward three and four are drawn the way they are. That's because John Foster needed to be re re protected. Joe Green needed to be re protected. The five individuals who lived on the west side uh, needed to be. Uh, protected. Jolie did not run under the ward system, but that seat was protected. And uh, I think it's very naive uh, to think that uh, that the powers to be won't take this, and you'll sit up, you'll sit there with uh, five powerful whites uh, running the school district, whether they're a combination of the West Side and Ocean View or wherever. But I think you're extremely, and I'm speaking collectively. Uh, when I say you'd be extremely naive to think that this would be a, uh, a straight shot when it comes to the election uh, at large. I, I just have to say a few, quickly a few things. This is not, school board is not city council. School board is not about sidewalks in a neighborhood. School board is about a neighbor, uh, uh, school system that is citywide and to reject that a white person from the west side cannot work as hard as they can be for a, uh, any neighborhood in this city is disappointing to me. 
I would also tell you, Angela, that I have been to many meetings and neighborhoods and schools in African American schools in neighborhoods because that's what we did on the school board. We worked as a group, not as a section of town or a section of school. And this school system will not thrive until we have seven people that are the best this city can produce that are interested in our school system, not our neighborhoods, not getting votes from a certain high school. I am disappointed that you think 15 years from now we might be able to get past this. I can promise you if we do ward system again, it's going to be a lot longer than 15 years. We can just perpetuate this and perpetuate this. We are old fogies. We grew up with this kind of injustice that you all have lived through. And I have not the, the history that you have, and I respect where, where you're coming from. But I feel passionately about the fact that we have a chance to move this city forward and look for the best people that we can elect for our school system as a whole. I really hope that you can put away our, um, what are we now, baby boomers generation and approach it as your son Julian would. You know, I was, I was just sitting here and thinking, and I don't know whether this is relevant or not, but uh, Dr. Whitby, you probably realize that you were nominated four times. I know that. By Paul Frame before you were accepted. I know that. On the, uh, on the uh, uh, school board. But if I would have elected, been elected, maybe I would have had the shadow government behind me. Well, <laughs> yeah. well that's, that's true. You probably but would But you have. know, Paul, we're talking about 16 years ago. Right. And I, I feel that our school board worked as a unit. We had African American, we had whites, and we made, in general, you know, our, our byword was all means all. And it was about all the kids, not a neighborhood, not a school. And if, if we don't keep pursuing that attitude, I worry about our school board. Uh, you know, I, I, Terry has appealed to our better angels, and I, I appreciate that. I, my experience in this city is that we are better when our groups are diverse. That's all. I mean, race still matters, especially when you have a, a, a school system that is 70% African American. You know, but you and know, Paul, I, we're also I, I, making I, I, I'm, I'm an exception. Not, I don't want African Americans argue. only vote for blacks. I think no, we I are understand. a better community than that. No, they vote for, they can voted vote for me too. I mean, they without voted. color. Well, and don't forget the growing uh, Hispanic population in the yes. school system, too. They need a representative as well. Since we're I don't know do that there's race. any right Hispanic answer to this. I mean, I'm not, you know, I mean, I could, could live with a couple of different of these things. I just... Yeah, but it's much, I will say, it's, I was the one who asked. I think that whenever you make a decision for the future, you can't make a decision for tomorrow without understanding the corporate knowledge of the past. And we're blessed with that corporate knowledge at this table whether we agree with it or disagree with it, we're blessed to have it because right or wrong, it allows us, and I'm the one who said, Paul Squared, tell us what you think. And that being said, it, it, the perspective that we receive from that is very important in understanding where we've been and where we're gonna go. And, and I greatly appreciate where Terry's coming from because it really is, I, I think, where we all eight want to be. And uh, I think some of us are looking at it as we do from the, the personal perspectives that we have as elected officials. But you know, hearing uh, the, that you know, from Terry and, and both Paul's is, is important in being able to make a decision for tomorrow. And that, that's not taking anything from anyone else who said anything, but that knowledge is significant in being able to move forward. I mean, I pick juries. And, and to tell you, picking a jury, as often as I pick them, if I told you that somehow that race did not enter into my mind as I'm selecting a jury, I'd be very disingenuous to you. And that I have to, uh, by the law, I have to 
examine the applicant or the prospective juror as I do and come up with race neutral reasons under Batson that says why I would or would not, why I have struck somebody from the panel. So, and uh, there are times that you're sitting there and, you're, and it makes you wonder. But I can tell you this, I have been wrong many a time when I tried to figure race in a case and many a time I blew it. So as much as we try to prognosticate in merely s selecting seven or 12 people in a box to lay judgment upon another, then it's, we're in a similar situation here. We're just trying to do the best we can. And in the end, frankly, more times than not, race really doesn't matter at times. Uh, sometimes it probably plays in. In certain cases, I'd, I'd be naive to say it, it didn't. But I think that we needed the history to be able to go forward. And I mean, I, you know, my, my argument, again, it's not necessarily tied to race. It's tied to just simple equal representation throughout the city. A white person could come out of Ward 3 or Ward four or my little smidgen of your ward. Um, a black person could come out of Terry's ward or Barclays or even Tommy's um, that is qualified to run. I just, again, I just want to make sure that what we have is equal representation of the entire city across the school board. And a ward to me is no different than a district. Um, just like Senate district, House district, it's a boundary. Well, my fear is well, when it comes to school board, and frankly is, is that I have got, I've got Granby. I'm blessed with Granby in my district. If somebody runs in that and has Granby as their high school, and Terry, this is what you spoke to. Again, the historical perspective of being on the school board that none of us have been on is, is my focus going to be Granby High School? When those phone calls come in, is my focus going to be on my ward? Or am I gonna say, oh, you're calling about something at Mari or Booker T, you need to call somebody else. And that, that, that sometimes is the danger of what happens. I can't tell you how many people I refer to Barkley uh, as my super ward person. But that, that occurs, and so, I, and I don't know if school board, if that's healthy. Uh, right now, I'm, I'm not sure if that's healthy or not. I think that if we ask Rodney or Terry, they both tell us that it's across the city, it, it's irrelevant, regardless of where the person lives. But am I going to support the, the parents at Granby, the PTA at Granby, because they elected me, versus uh, as a whole what the city what I would do for the city as a whole or what I would do for another, let's say, high school. So, and that's where a, a rub on that side that I would have to look at. I think whatever happens with this school board, it's going to take them some time to kind of gel together as a complete board. And I think that um, they're going to have to learn how to work together. I mean, even though all of us, and it, it may be different, um, as a school board than it is as a council, but if somebody calls me and they're not in my ward per se, I try to help them and um, make sure that they get to whoever it is that they need to get to in the city. And I think that as a school board, it, will, it may take some time for them to come together because it's a new board and there are a lot of things that they have to consider how they're going to operate, what the state statutes call for, um, those kinds of things that is a learning curve all in and of itself. So not only um, are they dealing with the school issues, but they're also phasing in, you're gonna still have some members of the board who are appointed, and you're gonna have some members of the board who are elected initially. How's that gonna work? Mm -hmm. You know, how are those people gonna, how, how's that all gonna gel together? And so, um, again, I just want to make sure that we have equal representation in the city and that everybody really gets a fair shot at running. And if people elect folks who are not qualified, then they're responsible for going back to the polls and 
unelecting them. So, I mean, at some point, voters have to have some responsibility in this, um, in this whole process, too. We're pushing 7 o'clock, and um, what is the council's pleasure? Would you like to have something to vote on um, as far as when we come back together in two weeks or a couple different ordinances or three ordinances? Or um, I, I think it's, and I would hope we could move on so, in some way. Is there, Tommy, you still want to take a head count, or do you want to? I, I think we should. Forward? I mean, that may eliminate one of them, or it may make it more confusing. Well, I, I heard Angela <coughs> say ward. Mm -hmm. I heard Terry say at large. Mr. Riddick has said ward. Barkley? Well, if we're going to stay in the May election cycle, whether we have very little interest, say the ward. If we could go to decide to move to the fall where we get more people out because there are other uh, people involved, then I would be leaning towards that large system. I just don't think there are enough, we don't bring enough people to the polls in May. And where, where are you tonight? Oh, at, at, with the mayor Stay where we are now, I'm at the ward system. Hybrid. Tommy. Hybrid or at large? Hybrids at large. Then maybe. Okay, well, it looks like there are one, two, three, there are five people whose first choice is Ward, and there are three whose first choice is, is are there two whose first choice is hybrid, and one Terry's at large, so w would it be fair to bring two ordinances next, uh, on the 27th, one that creates a system that follows our Ward system, and one that creates the hybrid system which I take it what you're in favor of is the one that Tommy has mapped out here. Is that okay? I mean, that's, at least we'll bring some, we'll try to move it down the road. Okay. Okay, we're going to take a short break, and we will start what in about, about, what about uh, well, wait, 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 wait. Uh, you, you tell me, Mr. Manager. I mean, we're four or five minutes from, from seven. I mean, would you guys want to, I mean, do you mind coming back, or would you? They had such a good time here tonight. <laughs> Sorry. Staff commuted, communicated with all the presenters, and they'd be fine with coming back. Okay. Thank you. All right, thanks. Mr. Mayor, Thank you, can we call over to the central plant and have them to give us some heat? <laughs> they're, they're working it on it right now. It is cold in here. Okay. It's one of the it punch didn't make lists. the budget. It's the punch list. We're gonna, we'll, we'll start again in like three minutes. <laughs>